today's session, first session is Local History Collections and Records for Family and Local History. My name is Elizabeth Hayden. I'm with the Government and Heritage Library. I'll be joined today by J Doug Brown of the State Archives of North Carolina. The State Library and the State Archives of North Carolina are both under the umbrella of the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. The State Archives has the original state and county records, while the State Library has state government publications, books, periodicals, and more. We are located at 109 East Jones Street in Raleigh. My short session today is going to be, um, I'm going to just discuss a couple of concepts that can help you in your research. And also, I want you to know what sources and services the Government Heritage Library has to offer. The Government Heritage Library, which is part of the State Library of North Carolina, has been collecting genealogical materials since the beginning of the, of the 20th century and we've been offering genealogical services since that time. And due to the popularity of genealogy, we, that is probably our most popular collection. The best place to start with us is at our webpage at http colon slash slash statelibrary.ncdcr.gov slash ghl. Also, you can visit our catalog to see what materials we own and titles by going to http colon slash slash ghl.ncardinal.org. Our genealogy collection resources include family histories and family vertical files, which are arranged by surname, census records that are available online, on microfilm, and in print, abstracts and indexes. We have military rosters from the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. We also have some military pension records. We have research databases including Ancestry, Fold3, and Heritage Quest. We have genealogical periodicals. Some are national in scope, some are by state, and then some are by county or region. We also have family newsletters and newspapers from all over the state, some even going back to the 18th century. One research tip that I'd like to offer is um, be sure to study the history of where and when your ancestor lived. County boundaries, county and state boundaries, change over time. Also, with um, one North Carolina county was even created in the 20th century. So it's very important to understand where your ancestor lived. Be sure to study the fan club. A prominent genealogist, Elizabeth Schoen Mills, coined the phrase fan club, which stands for family, friends, associates, and neighbors. These are the people your ancestor associated with. They might include bondsmen, witnesses um, of, of different documents, and it might also include neighbors um, who lived near your ancestor on, that you can find listed on the U.S. Census. Also, start locally. Public libraries have a lot to offer. You might be surprised at what your local library has. Be sure to start there. And then also universities sometimes have special collections that can help you with genealogical research. There are also family history centers run by the, the Church of Latter-day Saints. They are scattered all across the United States. There are three main types of records, federal, state, and county. Even though federal records, we think of those as being on the national level, well, think of the U.S. Census. That gives us very local information. Also, state records can have local information in them, especially in the early 19th century, where you might find name changes, divorce decrees, or emancipation information. 
also county information has a bounty of, of great resources. As far as indexes and abstracts go, we have all kinds of items, deeds, estate records, wills, cemetery records, census records, and much more than that. Sometimes these index, indexes and abstracts can help you pinpoint where an item is located, and in our case, a lot of them are located in the State Archives of North Carolina. We do also have other states besides North Carolina. We have information from, a lot of information from other states, including Virginia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, and Maryland. We do have some digital collections um, that we have partnered with the State Archives of North Carolina on. Um, many of them we have partnered with them on. Um, they can be found at http colon slash slash digital dot ncdcr dot gov. There are over 40 collections with thousands of titles. You can search across all of the collections or you can go into each individual collection. If you go to our web page and cursor down, you can cl click on North Carolina Digital Collections. They range from the 1901 Confederate pension applications to World War I posters. We even have a family history collection in our digital collection. We have some special services that can also help you with, our, with your research. One is Book a Librarian. This allows you to set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment with one of our librarians. And if you can't come to Raleigh in person, you can always book a librarian over the phone. We will give you a free 30-minute consultation. Just be sure to let us know in advance so we can schedule it. We also offer a service called Interlibrary Loan. Interlibrary loan allows, allows libraries across the United States share materials. One of the most popular materials in our collection that we send out to the U.S. libraries and even Canadian libraries are our newspapers. On our webpage, we have a Roots MOOC that can help beginning genealogists. A MOOC is a massive open online course, and a few years ago, we partner with the Z. Smith Reynolds Library at Wake Forest University to create this self-paced course. It includes tutorials and videos, and you can pick up lots of tips to help you get started. We also have chat reference. Uh, we would love to hear from you via chat. And starting in September, we have library cards for North Carolina residents. For any of these services, please contact us at the Government Heritage Library at slnc.reference at ncdcr.gov or call us at 919-807-7450. We would love to hear from you all. And again, my name is Elizabeth Hayden. I'm the Reference Resources Supervisor. Feel free to contact me at 919-807-7467. Thank you all so much, and I'm going to turn it now over to Doug. Okay, thanks very much, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. Um, now I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the, um, again, my name is Douglas Brown. I'm with the State Archives of North Carolina, and I just wanna discuss some of the very valuable local government records we care for and um, provide access to at the State Archives. When I'm talking about local records, what I'm referring to are records that were created by a local county government office or filed at one of the current 100 counties, courthouses, or six former counties that used to be in existence. These records document official government business or an interaction between a private individual or corporation and their local government. These records could go back to colonial times, to an era when we are subject to King George III, or even back more recently to a time when your grandpa George got in trouble with the law back in the 50s. So, look, what are local records and why does the State Archives have local records? 
um, why don't they stay in the county courthouses? One reason is that record keeping and storage in local courthouses was not always ideal, especially prior to 1900. Non-current records, which in other words mean that they're not actively used or seldom referenced in an office, may start to accumulate in dry attics or damp basements that become susceptible to mold or vermin. Some early courthouses were vulnerable to fires and floods and thefts. So in 1903, the state established the North Carolina Historical Commission. And one of its directives was to collect and preserve these non-current records which document the history of the state. For over the past 100 years, the commission and its current namesake, the Division of Archives and Records, has worked with local county government records to collect and preserve and transfer non-government current records of permanent value. In 1932, Albert Newsom, Secretary of the Historic Commission, stated that the official records of the various government offices constitute the chief monuments of North Carolina's past, and it was necessary to protect these records to keep a full and accurate history of the state. And North Carolina is very unique in that our state archives does collect local records and help them manage their records. And we serve as a central repository of county records. On this map, this is um, a map that identifies counties in North Carolina that have suffered record loss due to the courthouse fire. As you can see, the red ones are, there are 37 counties that have suffered courthouse fires. Some counties like Harnett and Bladen counties suffered more than one. And then there's another 33 counties where in yellow where records lost due to other reasons besides fire, like flood or theft. So that's 70 counties out of 100 that have known record loss. Unfortunately, this is not unusual and is fortunately the norm for most states. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the types of county records and um, a little bit about how we organize them. So on the, on the left, there's a list of nine categories of records. I'm gonna briefly define each of these categories and highlight some records that might be fruitful to a local historian or a family researcher. And I'll show a few examples. And I did try to focus on local records from the participating 19 libraries that are out there watching today. So perhaps you might recognize a familiar name or place in some of these records. And to the right is what's called the Guide to County Records in the North Carolina State Archives. Um, hopefully your library has this, and it's a, because it's a very good inventory of what records we have. It's a good place to start to kind of get a, a better general understanding of what we have for each county. The guide also will document what records we have on microfilm or copies of records that may still, the originals might still be in the county, for example, like deed books or will books. So in, it's also important to note that the volume of what we have for each county varies due to record loss, of course, or because the county may have chosen to maintain custody of the records for their citizens. And the guide also does have a very helpful glossary to help define some of the official titles of some of these records. Okay. So this first, we're going to just start in order. So the first category we're going to talk about are the bonds. A bond is really an, essentially an obligation requiring payment of money in the event that the conditions of an agreement are not met. There are several types of bonds we have in this category, yet most are really obsolete today and no longer kept in the counties. One example is this one here, for, it's called an apprentice bond, which is essentially an agreement to teach a child a, voca a vocational trade so that the child might not become a financial burden or a charge to the local community. In most instances, the child is an orphan or the parents are unable or maybe unwilling to care and train their child. On this example from our Burke County records, the apprentice bond provides the age of the child, which you can see there is age seven, and even notes that the mother is deceased and provides the name of the mother and the person also taking care of the child. The apprentice child will typically list a trade to be acquired and note a requirement to teach the child how to read and write. Other types of bonds related to apprentice bonds where the community is trying to protect them from undue costs or burdens are bastardy bonds. Bastardy bonds are records whereby the reputed father of an illegitimate child would be held responsible for the support of the child rather than, child rather than the county. Let's see. Next we'll talk a little bit about official bonds. Um, official bonds are ones where one performance to fill a public office or task. 
in this example here, we have one from Chatham County where the man is, is agreeing to keep and operate a ferry across the Hall River. There are other types of bonds for public officials such as sheriff, constable, register of deeds, clerk of court, tax of collectors and surveyors, and other local county government offices. There are other bonds related to keeping taverns or ordinary bonds as well. The second category we'll talk about is census records. Um, most counties and, oops, excuse me, is a, a census is typically a county's copy of the federal census that Elizabeth mentioned earlier. Most counties will only have the original copy from 1850 to 1880 time period. And as you can see on this one, it doesn't provide always the same information you'll find on the federal census. On this example from Wake County, it provides just the name, the race, the gender, and the age. On the federal copy, you might find much more information. So in other words, you're probably better off to, to start researching with the federal copy that's available online, or you could come to either the state library or your local library or the archives to look at the microfilm version. However, in the event you run into some dead ends, you're certainly welcome to visit us and we can provide access to the county copy as well. The third category we're going to talk about are the court records. Most counties maintain court records in large volumes called dockets. And probably the most useful document to, to take advantage of are the minute dockets, which provide the basic information regarding a court case or the other judicial matters. Another useful court record that contains information beyond the civil or criminal cases are the minute dockets for the court of pleas and quarter sessions. The pleas and quarter sessions was a court system that was in in existence in North Carolina prior to 1868. And they did not only proceeded over judicial matters, but also provided information about probate cases, such as proving a deed or a will, or um, a, other administrative functions, such as road maintenance or tax collections. So in this example, I put up for Cabarrus County, we can see that there is a person who's qualifying to be an executor of a will. There's another person who's of being appointed to be an overseer for the road. And then there's other list of information of people per, um, applying to get vacant land um, to, to pr perhaps purchase some vacant land. So these minutes not only provide helpful information for genealogical research, but they also will document day-to-day -day activities that were going on within the county government. Another um, helpful court record are that we'll have the the, any surviving criminal or civil case files in our custody. They are typically arranged by year or kept in order by a file system that was created by the county clerk of court office. Here's an example of one from Davidson County um, where this man was apparently arrested for stealing a car. Um, we, all, we often get calls for people, um, local people like yourself, who are trying to find out have a family lore or story about someone who got in trouble with the law or was a victim of a heinous crime. And so perhaps um, we can help you with that. So you can, of course, contact us. So as long as the crime took place before the mid to late 1960s, we can help you locate what records we have or refer you to the local clerk of court in the event that the records are still in their custody. The second common follow-up question we get regarding court records is, especially with a criminal case, is do you have transcripts of the trial? Unfortunately, that's usually not the case because they weren't kept permanently. But um, occasionally we might find a deposition or some details regarding a civil or criminal matter in these case files. Next, we're going to talk about the fourth category, which is land records. And of course, a common land record is simply a deed or agreement to transfer real property from one party to another. Since deeds are considered by the Register of Deeds a current record, most deed books remain in the custody of their office and are not sent to us. However, we have microfilm copies of deed books for patron use as well as the index to look up a deed. We also might get transferred from the local offices any original deeds that were never picked up by one of the parties involved in the transaction. So here's an example of an original deed from Cleveland County. The top portion of identifies the two parties, the grantor or the seller, and the grantee, the buyer, along with the consideration or the amount paid for, to the grantor. 
the deed below also describes the parcel land and will also sometimes identify previous owners, such in this case where this one was once part of a widow's dower. Another land record that's very helpful and interesting are the plats and surveys um, associated with land membership or the transfer of land to other parties. Here's one from Onslow County showing a nice drawing of a creek, even it shows Dower's land as well as even a house portrayed on the, on the plat as well. So you can also find like sometimes petitions to partition divide land as well as meets and bounds and measurements of tracts of lands whenever there's some sort of division of land. Next we'll talk about the estate records. So this is probably one of our more popular records that we um, get requests for. Um, these records deal with the inventory, settlement, and distribution of the property of a deceased person. These records are a tremendous benefit to genealogy researchers for tracing down family members. The state records may provide clues regarding a person's economic background. For in this example from Nash County, we have the state records for Joel Battle. Joel Battle was a prominent planter in the area and is one of the founders of the first textile mill in Rocky Mount. So on the left is his petition to create a dower for his widow. And on the right, we have an inventory of his money or notes that he had after his death. And it even notes at the top that he died of a disease at the very top of the heading. Another category within the estate records are called the guardian records. Um, here we have a guardian record for Henderson County. And guardian records deal with the management of a property owned by a minor or someone who was considered by law incapable of handling their own financial affairs. And so attached here is a petition from, again, Henderson County in which the guardian is actually the maternal grandmother of the minor and is asking for funds to be reallocated for medical expenses. And it also provides some helpful information or background on the situation with his parents as well. The next category we're going to talk a little bit about is the vital records. Um, we have in vital records are essentially the dealing with that documentation of the birth, the marriage and death of an individual, as well as other notable information such as the parents of the individual. Requests for birth and death certificates are very common with us, yet unfortunately the answer is not always ideal. First off, in North Carolina, birth and death certificates did not start officially until 1913. The other issue is that these re records remain locally with the county registrar's office. We only have the state agency's copy of a death certificate in the index to birth and death records on microfilm. Um, but again, the county will have custody of those from 1913 on. Also, marriage records sometimes remain with the local registrar's office as well. But we can assist researchers in locating early marriage records called marriage bonds or marriage records that we might have on microfilm. Here's an example of an early marriage license from New Hanover County. Fortunately, after the Civil War, record keeping changed to a certain extent, whereby the one no, big improvement was that they would provide the names of the parents. So we'll see on this marriage record from the 1870s, it provides the name of the, the the couple, of course, getting married along with their parents and also identifies their race. Another vital record I'll talk a little bit about are divorce records. Though it is essentially a court record, one could argue it is a better fit in the court record category. However, divorce, divorce records are classified as a vital record by the state archives. Often the divorce file contains the complaint or reason why the plaintiff is seeking a divorce from their spouse. In this example from Catawba County, the wife is accusing her husband of forcing her to sell real estate in her name and abandoning her once the property is sold. And on top of that, he is accused of committing adultery. And you may be able to see that he brought in a woman of lewd character. So depending on the time period, divorce records may be found outside the vital records category. Divorces prior to 1830, in fact, had to be petitioned before the General Assembly. And if you need a divorce from the 1900s, you should always consult with our reference staff and we can try to 
determine where the divorce record might be or determine if it would, might still be with the county court system. Next category we'll talk about are the tax records. That's the seventh category. The quantity of extant local tax records is pretty small, but they can be useful if you're having trouble locating people in the census. Here's an example from Person County from the St. Lawrence District in 1794. This list has columns for the three general items that local county governments usually tax. One is real property or land. The second one is the polls or tax on a living person of a certain age, usually 21 to 50 years old, and the personal property, such as horses or wagons. The age in which one is subject to a poll tax varies due to changes in the tax laws from the colonial times until 1970. But if one knows the taxable age for that time period, one could estimate the age of a person on a tax list. The eighth category we're going to talk about are wills. This is, again is another one of our more popular records that we deal with. Uh, a will is a written declaration of a person's wishes regarding the settlement of property after their death. The category is different from the estate category in that it is a formal declaration of a person's property while living while an estate record is, in, is, deals with the disposition of property if the person died intestate or without leaving a will. In this example, we're going to show one from Wake County, and it's for the will for a man named John Rex. Those from Raleigh might recognize that name Rex because he is the benefactor of one of our main hospitals here. John Rex was a successful tanner and planter originally from Pennsylvania who settled in Raleigh shortly after the time the capital was established in 1793. He died in 1839, a single man, and in his will he requested uh, two interesting things. One was that he wanted to establish a comfortable retreat for the sick and afflicted poor in Raleigh. Another interesting component of his will is that what he wanted to do with his slaves. He requested that all his slaves be returned to Africa through the American Colonization Society. And though funds to return the slaves were held up in court for 18 years, 16 of his 18 slaves eventually did settle in Liberia. Now we'll talk to the, on our final category, the miscellaneous records. And the miscellaneous records really essentially came a variety of records which do not easily fall into their previous eight categories, as well as some that were too small to be quantified in, a in one of the previous catalogs separately. There are probably over 30 different types of miscellaneous records, so I'll just discuss a few of the more popular record series. Here's a good example of an election record or voter registration book from Transylvania County. For a genealogist, one could determine an approximate year of birth if you subtract the age from the year of registration. The book also provides the place of birth, the race, and it might identify if the person has died or moved out of the county. Another popular miscellaneous record category are the coroner's inquests and examinations. These are records of a local coroner or sheriff related to the investigation of a sudden or unusual or mysterious death. Sometimes there might be one record stating how the person died, while others might contain pages of testimony and depositions regarding the circumstances leading to the person's death. Here's one example from Pender County, where Mr. Flynn is eating his breakfast and one of his friends just comes to his house, knocks on the door, and announces that he shot his buddy. And what I find funny in this is, or not funny about death, but anyway, he talks about he wants, he wants to finish his coffee before he takes off with his buddy to see what's going on. Next uh, category we deal with are the road records. Before the days of the State Highway Commission and Department of Transportation, local communities managed the upkeep and maintenance of roads, bridges, ferries, and canals. Here's an example of a road record from Gaston County, where a group of inhabitants signed a petition regarding the location of a new road. Road records can be helpful in locating signatures of neighbors as well as geographical features or buildings in the community. Another helpful miscellaneous record category are the school records. 
local communities may have retained school records that might list names of students, age, race, and the parents' names. Here's one example from Lincoln County for the Kings Mountain School District, where it names the head of household and the names of the, and the number of children enrolled. And another, one more miscellaneous record we'll talk about are the records dealing with the slaves and free persons of colors. In these records, we can typically keep bills of sales and deeds of transferring slaves from one party to another. There may be also be civil and criminal cases regarding slaves, records regarding runaway slaves, slave insurrections, or records such as the emancipation of a slave, in this example from Randolph County. And in this example, Mingo Pritchard hath hath behalved himself honestly and faithfully when we think meritorious, and therefore the petition of your petitioners is that you may be pleased to emancipate or manumit the above said slave Mingo Pritchard so that he may be a free man agreeable to law in your petitioners as in duty bound. And this is from 1801. And last, there is a, another oddball category we have called CRX. CRX records are records that at one time or another fallen out of the custody of the county government or the state archives. In this example, we have a lot of CRX records from Beaufort County, where at one time the records ended up in the Beaufort County Historical Commission, but they have since been transferred back to us in the 1970s. And the CRX records could be anything of the aforementioned nine categories or it could be something just totally random, like this example we have here for cheap tailoring, where, which is essentially an adver advertisement that a tailor had posted in a courthouse trying to get some business so he could make an honest living. And so now I'll finish up. Here's our contact information for the state archives. Our physical location is the same as the State Library, 109 East Jones Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our mailing address it's 4614 Mail Service Center, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27699-4614. Our phone number and email address is available as well. So feel free to call us if you have any more specific questions or, or intriguing research queries that you're trying to find. Um, depending on the query or if, it, if you have a specific record or information you need, we can probably help you remotely, especially if you're a North Carolina resident. You can simply send us an email with details of what you're looking for, or if you prefer to call us, that's fine too. And then we can try to advise you whether it's better to come in person to, to do this type of research or if it's something that we can settle for you remotely. So thank you again for your time, and we will now open it up for any questions you might have. And also please remember to fill out our survey at www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash virtual FHF 2017. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.